today. It's the most important day of the summer gaming schedule, my birthday. Ah. This is Chill Point. Well, happy birthday, Paul. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. The, see, what happens is they make sure that, you know, it used to be E3, but now the Summer Games Fest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all they make sure that all the game announcements come out s before my birthday. Right. So that people know what to buy me. Yeah. yeah. And so that yeah. nobody will be distracted by other things on your birthday. Exactly. It's like, yeah. exactly. It's like, like an advent calendar for Paul. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you see, your birthday basically always missed, just missed the school year, huh? Yeah, yeah. Ooh. My birthday was, was we, we, we would do like, you know, celebration of the... Uh, end of school, like if, get everybody over and be like everyone's super hype. <laughs> well, it's just it's just enough uh, before people maybe go on summer vacation right. too, so you can yeah have one, a party. One year we we actually like got people to like bring like some homework and like burn it. Oh, <laughs> nice! I like that. In the, in the celebration. Hey everybody, welcome to Chill Point Show, where we talk about the week's video game news. I am joined, of course as always, by Heather, and then special guest, Ian. It's your boy. Indeed. Indeed, our boy, <laughs> our collective boy, yes. <laughs> Ian. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Beej is a little under the weather at the moment, but uh, Ian is uh, here to Re add his perspective. Mm -hmm. You can be replaced on this show. <laughs> So I'm keep, finding out. Keep that yeah. as a warning. Yeah. I mean, you're the replacement, so you're new and special, and yeah. you don't have to worry about it for... Everyone gets one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, don't worry, we no... tested Graham on this show a couple times, too, and oh. we, the debate is still ongoing. Now, normally we would talk about uh, the week's episode of Checkpoint, but uh, no, no Checkpoint this week. Uh, hopefully we will be back with more Checkpoint next week. But uh, yeah, it turns out you can only replace people so far, and with everybody out of town and being <laughs> under the weather, it's uh, at some point we run out of people. Yeah. For the moment, I am only one man. <laughs> we are working on that technique. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but news still happens. I always say, like, for the last like fifteen years, mm -hmm. I think. I've been collecting video game news every week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so like even when uh, checkpoint, you know, if we're on hiatus or, or there's a break or there's something else happening, it's just second nature. Yep. <laughs> and so I keep collecting these news stories. So we might as well talk about For good stuff. Reason, yeah. uh, starting with one that I actually saw this morning that mm -hmm. I quite liked uh, about Guild Wars 2 which you may be uh, confused because the idea that there'd be new news to them coming out about Guild Wars 2. Guild Wars 2 is a very old, I think it's something like 15 years. It's one of those forever games. Yeah, old point. MMO. Uh, and, uh, but they have just updated it to add uh, housing like previously, like to add basically a, your, your own customizable house. You can live there now? House, yeah. Uh, and they what what was there's an article in game developer talking about and what was really interesting about this is they were trying to integrate integrate the like how they wanted to actually make housing uh in the game like what what purpose was it going to serve in the game right and mm -hmm. what was it going to do and they're like and what's interesting too is the um uh uh is it Andrew? Yeah, I'm gonna want Andrew, to know this name. Is it and the the um uh one of the uh yeah Andrew Gray, um I think is the guy who uh was he was he previously worked on Sims Four. Oh. Uh, oh well, then he knows all career. about housing and why you would put that in a video game. Well, he was talking about that that they were coming they sort of came at it because the game has been around for so so long without this mm -hmm. they were sort of coming at it from a different angle mm -hmm. than you know something like say uh uh final fantasy 14 or, or some of the other mmos that yeah. have sort of private 
places because they were like, what? So what is this going to serve? And they're basically like, look, we've been going for 15 years or whatever. There's only so many like armor styles that mm -hmm. you can make. We've made like 3,000 armor things. There just aren't any more customizable parts on your body. <laughs> ah, so, but what if we made clothes for your body? And so the, they had this idea that it's like, basically the, the idea behind these, what they're calling homesteads, is that they're not like, so one of the things that we've actually talked about before is like Final Fantasy XIV uh, has had a big problem with literally real estate mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. like, yeah, because there's it's, only so much of it. It's they really do a, stupid. I think they do a lottery-based system they, yeah, you know, a lot of the it's, time. It's that stupid thing where it's like, let's take something from that yeah. sucks in the real world and bring it into the virtual world. And not like world that fun lottery no system in Corpline where everybody puts their properties <laughs> in and see who gets what. Um, so instead I may have of rewatched that recently. Uh, so instead of um, doing that, they they have like the your home is sort of instance. Mm -hmm. So there's infinite. Uh, uh, space. Mm -hmm. Every account can not. It's not every uh, every character, but every account, account can have a, can have a house, can have a a homestead, and it almost is like the 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 goal of it, rather than like a place where you sort of start and end your uh, your day your, your day in, in thing. It's the idea is it's almost sounds like a uh, kind of like you know Animal Crossing or something where it's like. It's a cool thing to uh, to to customize and then to like show off to your you know your friends can come and visit. You can set up uh, you can set up like challenges mm -hmm. and apparently you can do stuff like you can choose whether uh, fall damage will be on or off within yeah. your homestead. I know I do that at home all the time. We have it's fall damage a, turned on, so uh, be careful when you come over. Personal liability insurance. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so the idea is is rather than, um, yeah, ra rather than a sort of actual like mechanical mm -hmm. thing, uh, it's it's a uh, yeah a thing to sort of show off. And the other thing that, that I thought was interesting is there's you know you can there's all sorts of items that you can craft to go into your house and you can buy things to go into your house right. stuff. You know, obviously, ultimately, there's some transactional aspect to this um but what they decided to do is because uh, guild wars already has a very developed crafting system mm -hmm. and they and but building or making things for your homestead is actually separate from the crafting system they're like we don't want you to just sit in your homestead uh building chairs or whatever right and so the the XP or the points that you need to get stuff for your homestead, you actually get through sort of end game raid uh, stuff. Okay. So they're like, we want to encourage people, like you know, mm. ultimately, of course, the whole point of this is to get people playing keep the game. People playing, yeah, right. keep them and so they want to get people to you know go out into the game, so, into the world, do their stuff, and then come back. Right. In order to stay at home and hide from everything, I have to go outside. Yeah. I don't know if I like this I, game. I'm just uh, really upset right now that these people were able to examine a housing crisis and make systemic changes to their entire base in order to support what it what their players need out of home ownership. How, who are these people and how do we get them into our federal governments? Mm. The other thing that I thought was really interesting is, um, again, talking about... Um, oh, no, sorry. Uh, is it... It's... Uh, Joel Eckhart is the one who has previously worked on oh, okay. Sims 4, not Andrew Gray. Anyway, Eckhart was talking talking about that one of the things that he learned from Sims 4 is that if you what doesn't work very well, like if what they do is they like when you create your homestead, there's sort of uh, some default things that they put in there. They're saying that they found from when they were making Sims 4 that if you uh, set up something and it's just like blank. Mm -hmm. People will not customize it. Like people will just—it's oh, well, that sort of blank canvas intimidation thing. 
uh, and they, they sort of don't know like how they should use the space. Mm. Right, it's like and staging a home to show it. So they made it so uh, they, there's like some existing decorations in, in place and different things can are set up so that you can, to sort of illustrate some of the things you can do, which is uh, a, a fun idea, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I've never played Guild Wars 2 <laughs> as a game. I don't know, you know, uh, I don't want to, you know, ringingly endorse the company because I don't know what they do. But uh, this is a cool idea, and I'm 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 happy that uh, they were able to sort of integrate this in a what appears to be a non-terrible way. Yeah. <laughs> so, good good I, on you. I hope you like it. Yeah, if, yeah. If well, um, okay. When it comes to a video game you like, I hope it's something you enjoy or it's something you can ignore. Like those are always good. <laughs> Oh, you don't have to play every part of a video game. No, no. Then you... All the time, usually. <laughs> Sometimes you just go in and play Mahjong for four hours. <laughs> uh, all right. So, do 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 you like playing uh, games on the cloud? No. For the purpose of yeah. the bit, <laughs> yes. I was going to say, uh, statistically, probably not. <laughs> not in this office. Yeah. And also judging from, you know, the various, the about half dozen services that we've covered over the years uh, that have... Stadia ain't around no more. Yeah, no. that have gone down the tubes. But Is GeForce now is still a thing? Uh, I think so, yeah. I think it's okay. still technically a thing. GeForce still now, not them. Uh, anyway... Um, Amazon and Microsoft are uh, getting together and certain Amazon Fire TV sticks, which are sort of the little little uh, ones. Dongles. dongle things that you can plug into your TV to, to allow it to do TV stuff, uh, will have um, Xbox Cloud apps on it. <laughs> an, an, or an Xbox Cloud app, which will allow you to play Xbox Cloud games. So, I mean, one, uh, you have to have one of the higher end Amazon Fire TV sticks, mm -hmm. the 4K Max or the 4K. Yeah. Um, you have to have an Xbox Game Pass to mm -hmm. actually play the games. Subscription, okay. Um, controller? You, yeah, you also have to have like a Bluetooth controller. You also have to have a controller. Not necessarily an Xbox controller, which is nice of them. Yeah. Um, they suggest an Xbox it controller, but apparently works it works... It Best works with an Xbox controller. Apparently, it does work with like a yeah dual sense or whatever. Of course, your little uh, prompts will be wrong probably. Yeah, I imagine yeah. Xbox Cloud probably doesn't take into account that you could be using a PlayStation controller. It probably won't <laughs> want to. Um, and I'm not saying that you probably can't use something else. Just it is probably optimized for an Xbox controller, so it will and probably then, work best with yeah. one. Uh, and then finally, uh, obviously, you have to have uh, pretty good internet. And not only pretty good internet, but internet that is physically close to uh, wherever they're serving these from. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't actually know where Xbox Cloud has. I presume they have, serv they have servers all over the place. I know from a little bit of testing I've done myself when I had Xbox uh, Game Pass, mm -hmm. uh, I was kind of medium in mm. here, but... Uh, Victoria is not that close. Yeah. Like well, probably we're we're probably either going to Vancouver or going to Seattle. We've got an so. under, uh, underwater hop to make whichever direction we're going, and yeah. that's never good for. And there's those, some of those games are very large. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So anyway, um, but this is I mean you know for the jump that they have to make. Okay. Yes. Back <laughs> like in some ways this is the dream, right? This is what always has been the thing is that. You know, back to the days of like on live, I think it was called. Oh yeah. Um, where they would sell you the micro console. Yes. Right, which was just this little box yep. that again didn't have any stuff on it, but the idea was you could plug it in and then it would connect to the on live service. The Nintendo and... Teleview did that. The uh, the Genesis had its Sega Channel. Right. I guess that's. I mean, it's different but similar idea. Mm -hmm. I guess. It, yeah. That's, I think your your data for the game is smaller than actually sending a frame over it. Over right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the you know the the idea of of making a little teeny weeny uh, set top box that doesn't have any actual stuff in it, it mm -hmm. just connects up to the thing, 
it's something that they've tried to do many times. I mean, Steam boxes well, were kind of like what that it, was it, too. It, it, it works super well in corporate environments, like uh, like an insurance depot. I know my insurance company uses it, or all those car dealerships that got hacked recently this week. Mm. You know, you you just have this dumb terminal that sits on your desk that's a monitor and essentially just a H two six four decoder that sends USB input back to a central server. Um, and so. Uh, but the idea that it, rather than like Microsoft making a little micro console you have to buy, the idea that, you know, that this can be just sort of loaded onto, or that this can be loaded onto a Fire Stick, and presumably they could, you know, make yeah. agreements with, I don't know, Roku and other oh, other people. Any, anyone mm. who has sufficient um, and capabilities. So the idea that, or, or even like smart TVs or whatever, mm. they're like, this could just be a thing that's built into your device it or, or uh, literally is now the uh, the open source alternative the luna uh, runs already natively on my lg tv i mean luna is amazon it was amazon's uh, streaming service which, whichever the open source version of it is though oh i don't know what that is yeah, yeah. i mean this is this is a thing that they're going to want in the future but we're still going to have the, the the same problems until it's, it's going to be people's internet uh and ultimately I mean, well, it's a subscription service, and it's it's whatever, it's uh, which is more affordable on a month to month basis. Maybe if that's the kind of gaming you want to do. Buying enough games every month, yeah. But it it also can be more expensive in the long run, depending on how you game. What I find really interesting here is that this announcement was made the same week that we had that leak via patent filings of an Xbox Series version that was going to be uh, not not only digital only, but also uh, streaming only for the oh. sort of streaming. Because, I mean, yeah, because they've talked about a, so a streaming only. So, again, that would be like a, a sort of micro console. Exactly. Idea. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, like I said, I've, I've you know, there is a fundamental, uh, you know, speed of light aspect that mm -hmm. uh, makes it like certain games just, aren't going to work but there are certain games that can work very nicely um and i can see certain certain aspects especially like you know in, in this article it's talking about like something like starfield right mm -hmm. it's I don't not know. a twitch game it's not see. it's not a twitch game twitchy twitchy um it's uh i mean whether or not you can think it's a good game or not it is a game that is super heavy on the uh you know on its and its requirements like mm -hmm. If you if you you know it has the capability of looking super super pretty, if you've got the juice to do it, and you know people were like upgrading their systems to to you yeah. know uh, uh, four thousand series um, Nvidia cards to get Starfield, they were probably a little disappointed when it came out. <laughs> I mean, but um, most of these games come out kind of pre bugged these days with uh, lots of things. So if you're playing it cloud wise and it seems a little choppy. That's just the first day yep. game experience. <laughs> that's yeah. true. That's true. It, uh, you know, if yeah, if you got whatever cyberpunk or whatever, and it was a little choppy when you got it, that was <laughs> actually that, that probably that would have been better for you. Yeah, the cloud one, wasn't the problem one. on that one. I heard that's changed quite a bit since the, they first launched that yeah, game. Yeah. But I, I launch, yeah, that, was, that probably would have been a nicer experience. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I think that's an interesting idea. Um, it's also, I mean, again, it's kind of interesting that. Because Amazon does have Luna, which is sort of one of the only other uh, street, like now that, because Stadia went kaputski, uh, Luna is sort of, other than Xbox, the uh, uh, live. Um, it's the only, uh, it's one of the only other ones. commercial cloud ones that has sort of stuck around. It doesn't seem, I haven't heard that much about it in terms of being very successful though. Real-time follow-up, Moonlight was the name of the, of the software I was talking about. Ah. That does that, which I yeah. get. That the, <laughs> is it hooking into the Luna system? But it, no, you know. it's 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 sort of per, your own personal streaming cloud. So right. like stream or Steam home right. streaming. Steam home oh, streaming okay. is something. Yeah, yeah, allows you to do it over a network connection remotely. Um, but yeah, it's uh, interesting to see Microsoft make this this sort of partnership with Amazon specifically. I feel like this is something we'll see probably spread out to, as you said, other uh, places where it can run. I mean, I think Microsoft has to make some of these partnerships, given that the whole Activision Blizzard 
acquisition lawsuit thing kept going <laughs> and they kept trying to say they, they weren't a monopoly oh. by doing certain things. So I feel like this is just them trying to strengthen that position we are gonna continue for, to talk for about, long term. We're going to continue to talk about some anti-competitive behavior today, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, do, 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 do. Hey, um, there's a new Hitman. Well, <laughs> so Hitman uh, has these continual... Continual uh, DLCs called uh, elusive targets. It's mm-hmm. kind of become a, I guess not necessarily live service kind of game, but just like they didn't they just they stop making new iterations of Hitman and they just have one. Yeah, now? yeah. Seasonal, I think. It's seasonal, yeah. Seasonal, yeah. It, it, Hitman, which its naming system has always been like super dumb. <laughs> like they're one of these <laughs> games that has gone through like Hitman one, two, three about three times oh, okay. and so the rebooted meaning, and yeah. changed and redone things. And then they just did Hitman World of Assassination and they were like, this will be great. It'll be just the one the one system and the one thing instead of Hitman 1, 2, and 3. And they're like, and everyone's like, oh, great. So does that mean we get all the Hitman 1, 2, and 3 levels <laughs> in World of Assassination? No. And no, no, no. There's like three different versions of the World of Assassination except you and you can get DLC and stuff. They have been having, still complicated. Yeah. Got I it. Say though, that the, when you're playing a Hitman game, you know you're playing a Hitman game because the branding is very strong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, the they have these things called elusive targets, where it's like a time limited uh, special event where they have a, a, a particular level target and stuff. And in as a sort of marketing tie-in with the um, recent. Uh, Roadhouse remake uh, that came out also on Amazon. I'm learning out so much today. Uh, which is actually kind of, it's actually quite entertaining. I've seen, yeah. Uh, Connor McGregor is going, is the, the target. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's called, uh, was it, the character is called The Disruptor. Uh, so it's not like Connor McGregor, but it's Connor, he, he's a guy. Who looks like Conor McGregor and who is an MMA fighter? Is also an MMA fighter because that's what Conor McGregor. I, yeah, legit. I thought Conor McGregor was one of the Highlanders before doing this <laughs> stuff on the page here. That's McLeod. Yes, Conor McLeod. Yeah, no, yeah, Conor McGregor. I I don't know if he's currently he's still the Uf, the UFC title holder, but he is one of the. Uh, uh, he has been a UFC title holder for quite a while. Extremely, uh, extremely scary kind of guy, mm-hmm. um, and has had uh, some some questionable things happening in his personal life as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes isn't able to keep the, the punching people entirely in the ring, as you sometimes happens with yep. these things. Um, I will say, I, like I said, I saw Roadhouse. He does a very good job in that, uh, in terms of just being a big scary, you know, being not I mean, not even big scary, but being. A scary guy who legitimately looks like he's who he actually is, presence, yeah. which is a, a fighter. Uh, that's a great interview where he's talking about, you know, having to learn how to like not kill people, <laughs> <laughs> like how you do how you do all these moves to make them like look cool but not actually you hurt know, the mo- person. Most of us have to prove that before we go to get to kindergarten. <laughs> Wait, what? Well, you had to take a. A uh, test before you went to kindergarten. No, I about challenged that? that test beforehand by not killing anyone in my life up to that point. Oh, okay. Um, but anyway, so uh, if uh, you have opinions about Conor McGregor one way or another, you can resolve them in <laughs> uh, Hitman uh, by uh, going after by going after him. And in fact, because the, these limited uh, time things are actually, you can play it for free. Um, Right. There's like the Hitman starter pack or something that you can download that's like sort of a demo. You get like one area, one mission to play, and then but you also get some of these limited oh, time okay. things that come yeah. in every once in well, a while. Well, because they, they, the, the paid for microtransaction DLC portion is for like cosmetics or something, mm-hmm. right? It's like a well, and, coat or. And a... also level, and, and also like new levels. And oh, stuff. I meant in regards to the el- elusive oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. mission. Um, yeah, because you can also buy it in order to have a bunch of cosmetic stuff as well, okay. yeah. which is like 
Conor McGregor uh, apparently is known for like wearing a big like yeah. fur coat. I do think it would be weird as an assassination expert to be the one paying to going and assassinating people, <laughs> as opposed to people paying you to go do the the crime. Uh, and uh, here here we have uh, that's not Connor, that that is Agent Forty Seven uh, in his typical I- incredibly skilled disguise outfit, which is. Giant bald guy wearing whatever outfit. Yeah, yeah that's wearing. a person I cross the street from. Like, if it, I walk it by, it doesn't say assassin to me, but it still absolutely says this is a person who's going to kill a man. I love, uh, I love. I mean, I, I, I've played a lot of the Assassin's Creed games, or not Assassin's Creed. <laughs> Hitman, Hitman games, assassinating. You I know. mean, the other I've one assassinated is also people true. You've a also lot played a lot yeah. of the Assassin's Creed. Games. Look, I just, I've assassinated people in a lot of games. I can't keep them all straight. <laughs> Uh, I don't but need to know all the bad stories. I do love the 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 sort of um, and it's sort of it's sort of lampshaded sometimes too. Is the 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 conceit in the Hitman games is that yeah he can put on any outfits and then he just like blends in and it's like I don't remember having a chef that was like six foot five and <laughs> super jacked <laughs> and had a big barcode tattoo yeah. on the back of his neck. <laughs> But eh, it's probably not. It's like, why is that guy delivering flowers? <laughs> it's not or even sunny today. Maybe yeah. maybe they should consider an Assassin's Creed crossover with Ant Man. I mean, that would be cool. I'm surprised that they haven't uh, they haven't done a. Uh, yeah, it turns out Agent Forty Seven is actually part of the League of Assassins. I, I feel like we'd end up with a situation like uh, the, the Fast and the Furious movies, where neither of them could could lose a fight to the other, so they'd have to team up instead. Right. Oh, right. that could be fun though. Fun. But there, there are there there has been at least like two or three uh, uh, Hitman missions, like scenarios, because of course they, they're sort of these <laughs> big, they're set these sort pieces. of big set pieces, but where there's like a guy who is um like clearly uh a large bald white guy <laughs> yeah. uh who's like you know a movie star or a something like there there'll be a other another random character walking around that is like I can definitely pose as that guy <laughs> <laughs> so yeah if you want to be safe in the world of agent 47 uh, be agent 47 well you just 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 yeah have make sure that you don't allow any uh yeah giant bald white guys <laughs> near you yeah, yeah if i show up and start uh start smiling a lot less and wearing my sunglasses a lot more you may want to check the neck yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah neck checks especially if ian just starts wearing a fur coat and nothing else <laughs> i just kind of feel like at that point it's incredibly suspicious at that point it's time for an intervention heather uh um now we talked about uh guild wars 2 yes it's an old old uh older uh mmo uh i'm gonna talk about another ancient game let's talk about another older game uh namely old school runescape mm. uh not to be confused with new new school, new, rune, new school no, regular runescape. runescape what school of runescape did you go to uh when so did Ru- you graduate? yeah runescape has, runescape. There's, there's at least two separate runescapes there might even be a third one um that have sort of it's like people who didn't it's sort of how they did like wow classic mm-hmm. except they like did that long time they, they did this split like a long time ago for like People who like the old version, yep. people like the new version. Anyway. And then did it again. Classic old school and new one. Okay, so there is a different one anyway. Okay. Um, so there there was a, a, they have like random events that happen. And there was one called um, like Kiss the Frog or, or the, the. Oh, okay. The, I was wondering what the heck this Reddit post the, was about that you had linked. Yeah, sorry. I, it, the, so the, this is one of these articles. There are one of these little things that I like picked up. Uh, from just sort of a random place, uh, but I thought it was kind of funny. So there's this, so so there's there's a random thing where uh, there'll be a frog, and you you can you can kiss the frog to become a, and the frog turns into like a prince. Okay, and then, and then you get like a bonus. As you do, yeah. Yeah, the frog, uh, depending on what uh, gender your character is. The frog will be the opposite gender, so it'll either be a 
Turn, oh. You know, kiss the frog, it'll turn into yeah. a prince, or kiss the frog and turn into a princess. Yeah, it's binary system. Got it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and it gives you a bonus. And if you, I think if you decline to kiss the frog, you like get turned into a frog yourself or something. Like there's <gasps> there's there's a there's a punishment for. Why would I never never reject the frog then? <laughs> I could be a frog. There's a punishment for not upholding the gender binary. Uh, so yeah, some people. Sorry, gender found frog. Some people were like, hey, you know. That's that seems, that, that seems limiting. limiting. Uh, not only is it like you know the opposite of whoever whatever you are, but in order to complete the mission, you have to kiss the frog, and it's you know this is just like a little uh, sprite based mm -hmm. game. So it's not like there's any you know uh, ex not explicit. E explicit deep throat kissing or something, but you know people are like hey maybe and. and you know, I guess the the Rootscape folks um, uh, saw that and had a little extra time. And uh, in the latest update, they modified it so you can also pat the frog on the head. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> and oh. that also oh. uh, that that also solves the, the mission. It solves the quest and turns the, the uh, frog into fr friendship frog. Yeah, <laughs> you can friend zone the frog basically uh. rather than kissing the frog. You could give it a little pat on the head. Uh, and uh, the reason why, so, I mean, one, that's kind of funny, but also, uh, it caused some, con you know. That explains the rest of that Reddit thread, though. Some fun consternation. Uh, and, and, you know, this is a very, very much, I don't want to blow this out of proportion. This is very much like a Tempest in Small the Teapot pixels. kind of thing. But at least the, uh, subreddit, um, got, uh, had some pretty strong feelings uh, one both ways uh, about like hey this is a cool this is a cool thing they did versus you know why are they wasting their time doing this when they should okay. be blah blah okay. blah blah so blah, when I clicked on a they're, thing they're they're bowing to the wokey whatever when, when when I when I clicked on because Paul yeah. produces a document I click on all of the articles <laughs> I maybe skim through some of them that I'm less interested in. But I got this sent is, to a Reddit thread that had a angry, picture, just this, a picture. This is just an angry about, Reddit about thread. this thing about a frog, and I didn't. Was, I was like, okay. And the the first few comments I read was just stuff that was like, I'm gonna really fuck that frog. I don't. <laughs> I don't know what Tempest Teapot you're talking about. It was just a lot of people who really wanted to deep throat the frog now. So okay, they seemed uh, all very in line to me. I didn't read very far. Maybe it gets I, more nuanced as you go down, I, but I doubt it. I feel like possibly the up and down votes in that thread may have changed since I linked to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the danger of linking to a Reddit thread. Heather, do you have your comments on Reddit set to sort by frog fucker? Uh, no, I don't have a Reddit account. Ah, okay. I, uh, for just very default. specific reasons. So I'm just a default Reddit. Watch her sometimes when forced to go there. Yeah, but uh, Paul. I, uh, I I like this. What what I love about this is, uh, this is my th this is one of those you, you end up with one of these great arguments, uh, uh, that that you know fan bases often get into where the both sides have to um, argue about how little they care. <laughs> And so yes. they'll be they'll be like, you know, so the the you know the the people who didn't like this update will be like, I just you know I just don't know why they spent so much you know they spent a bunch of time on this when it could have been doing they could have been doing something else, uh, and it just it doesn't matter. And then of course people go by it's like if it doesn't matter, why are you spending all this time complaining about yeah. it? And then they'll be like, I just you know. It goes back and forth, and then be like, you know, somebody would be like, in the time this conversation has gone back and forth on Reddit, they like this probably wasn't a long, like a big update. This mm. is probably didn't take them that long to do, uh, and uh, which I, I like the the a take that somebody had, you know, because people are like, obviously, as with any game, there's a laundry list of things people are like, they should be fixing this. Why are they working on this other thing that I don't like, mm -hmm. and and. My my favorite take was somebody was like, look, sometimes when you're, you know, if you're working on a project, you're, you get sick of what you're currently doing, or you are, you know, get kind of burned out, mm -hmm. or it's, you know, uh, whatever, 
two o'clock on a Friday afternoon yeah, you and you don't to, want to start a new big thing. You just need to push something. And and sometimes you're like, look, I'm just going to look through, you know, I'll, I'll look through like the bug reports and find something easy. And somebody was like, hey, somebody put this in as a thing. Sure, we could do this. Boom, boom. Like, it's not like this is going to be taking a lot of resources away from no. other projects. And it's just like, hey, maybe a couple people uh, are like the idea that you can now pat the frog yeah. on the head instead of being forced to kiss the frog in order to accomplish the task. As we round mm -hmm. into the second period of Pride season, I would like to see more companies take up, find a little bit of extra time to fix some tiny issues. <laughs> anyway. Uh, let's see what else we got going on here. <laughs> something uh, different than frog fucking? Yeah, something different from frogs. Uh, Capcom is... Uh, Meta around. metaphorically kissing the frog that is dead rising uh, uh, and turning it into a game again uh, okay so the big um, the big thing about this is so there's a they, they, Capcom has announced a dead rising remaster looks good yeah which looks great and dead rising super cool game yeah. important to note though this is not a dead rising remaster this is a dead rising re remaster because mm -hmm. dead rising has already been remastered once so this is they're going to remaster it once again this is called i think they're calling it a deluxe remaster mm -hmm. and they're apparently the, there's like they're getting like a new voice actor for frank west oh and frank's got a new uh, new model too he looks way less lumpy <laughs> no his lumpiness was part of his charm <laughs> uh so yeah we don't we don't have the we don't have um uh release dates on it sometime this year they say um but yes an updated so we... release with a brand new look and uh apparently he's yeah sporting a new voice actor and uh they're like redoing the whole town and everything we, so we don't have release dates on it but they're saying sometime this year mm -hmm. yeah i'd probably just push that into next year <laughs> it's given that it's like almost july yeah, yeah. I know it's a, re a remaster of a remaster of a remaster or whatever, but <laughs> there's the yeah. I, I feel like if you're not super sure by the end of June, you might as well just say 2025. <laughs> uh, I might, might, might push it out for holiday. Do, 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 do. Okay, so this is actually an update <laughs> to I think something that we talked about. I don't think it ever actually made it to a checkpoint, but we definitely talked about it on chill point. Yeah. Uh, you have to. Is that, so, a few years ago now, um, a guy uh, made a custom controller for um, a game called Armadillo Run, I think it's called. Armadillo Racing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, which was an obscure 90s uh, arcade-only game because it had a custom the the game it had a ball controller it had a custom a custom giant trackball controller in the arcade and a guy wanted to replicate that experience to DIY it and built his own thing and it's like using he's using these um uh little i think they're they're like uh 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 what what do you call it like um deodorant roller oh, yeah, things. Yeah, yes. I was wondering what those were in the... Uh, I think they're yeah. like deodorant roller to get the little like ball. Mm -hmm. So there's like three three of these things um, and it's a... Uh, it allows it to track the location like, of this ball. Oh, the this plastic case. ball that's in the... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Those, those yeah, yeah. are just your, your, your gross rollers. The, the fine reading. I was watching the video of him putting this together. I can't believe he recreated an old ball mouse yeah. out of a currently existing optical mouse. Yeah, he like... Update uh, uh, turns so it yeah. turned up turns yeah. a thing, puts ball bearings in it, and then puts a ball in it, and that ball is what's yeah, read it, by it the was, sensor. It was like and a big ball on top of that. It was like the mouse ball too from a, from another mouse, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, so then, yeah, he made the model and everything. So, like I said, this was a story that happened a few years ago. Uh, in the meantime, uh, some other games. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have come out so in the meantime um he he also adapted it to work with um katamari Demosi, of mm -hmm. course mm -hmm. as you might got it as you might expect and uh you may have i've seen actually ads for it like on youtube uh so you may have seen ads about it 
there's a new monkey ball game coming out. Yeah. I, I'm going to caution you if you're going to play that video to silence the video because <laughs> the music they use in the background is definitely going to get us copyright. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will Im- silence. Im- immediately because it, it's... Okay. Yeah. Raffy. Raffy. So it's kind of an annoying song for what was going on. But, but. Uh, yeah, so here's here's the, the ball. Uh, he, so he's got this whole, like, setup for it. The jank is amazing. It's the fact that... Oh, yeah, putting the... Putting the oh, I think it's more like a, a bouncy ball, really. Uh, but the, 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 he's remaking it with the transparent ball with a little monkey inside in order to uh, effectively replicate the system. The verisimilitude is, is awe-inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> Especially since he's got uh, the monkey on like a gyro so that it like stays upright yeah. <laughs> while he spins the thing like it is in the game. Yeah. Amazing work. Uh, so I am, I am always, always a big fan <laughs> of uh, ridiculous controllers, mm-hmm. DIY things. Um, Banana phone. Uh, all right. Well, let's. We said it was coming. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Some of this uh, uh, talking about um, people people not necessarily uh, playing playing nicely together uh, from a copyright perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, now. A little while ago, there was kind of we. I think we talked about it maybe even on checkpoint. Briefly, not like in great great depth. But uh, uh, Apple made a change to their um, their App Store App policies. Reviews. Yeah, reviews um, policies. To allow uh, console emulators for the first time. Retro. But specifically. Specifically retro. Ones. Only retro console mm-hmm. emulators. Uh, the definition of what a retro console is. Apple's not going to tell you. Uh, you know, it's, it's okay. The internet can't figure we, it out we, either. We can, we can argue a lot of things could be retro consoles at this point. Um, and it's, I feel like that's one of those things where when you start naming consoles and tell, saying, telling people how old they are, then they crumble into oh, dust very quickly. I was arguing with my uh, dentist just the other day about whether or not the Backstreet Boys should be considered oldies at this point. And I think so. <laughs> When I was when I was in the, a child in the eighties, listening to the oldies station, it was music from the fifties, sixties, and seventies. Therefore, anything within that thirty, that ten year period back, must therefore be considered an oldie. Did your dentist then go, hmm? Looks like we need to take out a few more of those teeth. <laughs> Actually, he yeah, so he was going to retire and go sailing. <laughs> For real. Because because of the strength of your arguments. I'm going to say yes. Say, like, yeah, I, if I, Backstreet I Boys are oldies. I'm going sailing. I mean, what really made me crumble to dust was him telling me he was less than 40, so. Mm. I mean, I don't consider anything old until the people who make that music are dead. Uh, so, anyway. Um, so, iOS has allowed, uh, has started to allow retro consoles. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have, and so people were like, oh, cool, retro consoles. You know what's another retro video game thing that we could now get in there? Old DOS games, mm-hmm. retro oh, yeah, PC okay. games, games uh, that nobody knows how to run anymore. Yeah, because there's a lot of there, there's a, you know you get and there's a lot of nostalgia for that. You know, you get you got you got your you know Wolfenstein's and your Dooms and you got syndicates. Your, yeah, yeah, your 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 old wasteland uh, uh, and S- Snake Fallout. But Apple has said no, uh, despite the fact that they. That, that retro consoles are allowed. Um, they have said they have decided that the i. This is uh, the uh, a blog post from a the developer of iDOS, which was a DOSBox port mm-hmm. for DOSBox being a, a multi-platform DOS emulator. It's very cool. Um, but uh, he made his point about iDOS, and he says they have decided to uh, that iDOS is not a retro game console. So the new rule is not applicable. They, su- I love this. They suggested I make changes and resubmit for review. When I asked what changes I should make to be compliant, they had no idea. It's like, 
we don't, yeah, your, your IDOS game, uh, your IDOS program, uh, you know, we can't accept it. Please make changes and resubmit so that it isn't a DOS simulator yeah, anymore. Definitely par for the course <laughs> behavior from Apple. Not, we're not saying yeah. we can't make this, but we're just saying we can't accept it in its current state. I mean, any, any rejection I get from any company never comes with an explanation of why. Mm -hmm. uh, YouTube does this a lot when they, they say, oh, your ads are now limited because of a thing that happened in your video. When you put up a three hour stream video, I mean, you can make some guesses as to probably what happened given the group of friends that you know are there. But at the same time, when you ask, hey, what part of the video is the problem? And they won't tell you. And they just tell you to look at the guidelines. It's a little frustrating because I don't feel like real people have watched it. Yeah. I mean, it's probably true. It's probably true of this too, really. Uh, and uh, there's also um, a... Uh... Uh, somebody who actually made a retro uh, iOS device emulator, which I think is actually pretty awesome, mm -hmm. that you could like emulate like an iPhone two, yeah, on well, a on a new iPhone. Well, that's oh, a, I mean, kind that of a would fun be cool. idea. Yeah. Well, that's a legitimate, important use case for people who might want to play older iOS games that are not available on the store anymore. Right. Yeah. That they yeah. they uh, that there there they, are games that down. haven't been updated because mm -hmm. the the devs haven't updated them and your uh, your operating system can't run them anymore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, the App Store yeah is specific. The 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 review guidelines are specifically. It's just the fact that they're they are specifically worded to retro game console emulators and it's like you know what what is there fundamentally about a retro game console that is different from a game running in dos box uh, well i i don't know there is okay the console wars was a thing and uh computers didn't count mm. <laughs> So mm -hmm. uh, by retro console standards, it's still not a console. Like, the issue here is that it seems like Apple just doesn't want emulators running on their systems because they don't want a source of software uh, that is available to people who are using the system that hasn't been approved by Apple, hasn't gone through their review process. Right, I guess it opens up the, the window to a sort of sideloading, except not actually sideloading. Exactly, yeah. Because yeah. it wouldn't actually have access to any of the phone's so, capabilities. Yeah, but. so the minute you can you can start running a, uh, a, a DOS emulator on, uh, on, on your computer, you can actually start you know using different browsers, potentially, if, it's, if they're able to run uh, their own code arbitrarily. Mm. And so that's what part of the problem is here, that the people who are uh, presenting the UTM uh, system, they ha had to present two different versions to Apple uh, to get approval, one which used just-in-time encoding of their own design, and one that did not. The just-in-time encoding-based uh, system was usable and fast and you know real-time, whereas the other version, it, all in software emulation, was just so slow as to be not worth, uh, not worth releasing which was the similar problem that the people who make the Dolphin emulator had trying to get it onto the, uh, the OS. It's that the Apple wants to maintain their, their console-like control of this computing-based platform. And unfortunately, because, it's, uh, because phones are so important and are such a big enough part of our lives that they do require regulation from, from government officials, Apple's trying to hold on to as much control as they have right now Right, just to maintain their own business model, and I mean, I guess Apple's uh, argument, I guess, is that uh, the they can't allow third party access to those low to sort of more low level system functions without compromising the security yeah. of the system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whether that's true or not, I mean, you know, most whatever. of the uh, the but, the hacks I've read on how to do for other gaming systems have usually been through using an email app to get to get mm. the code onto the system or mm. things like that in a system that you can't otherwise just put things on. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, we'll we'll see. I mean, one of the big things that's uh because of various EU uh regulation stuff is theoretically um you know, starting to uh be forced to allow cer certain types of side loading and third-party app stores. Mm -hmm. right. um, and so we'll see if 
what the fallout of that is, whether that makes it over to North America, we'll mm -hmm. see. It's a very interesting back and forth that they've got going on right now, and it's it's going to take some time, and there's going to be yeah. a lot of angry people in the meantime. But yeah, hopefully. like a lot of those things, it, it tends to be a very slow process. Yeah. Uh, speaking of something that's kind of a slow process, uh, <laughs> the GBA. <laughs> I thought this was super cool. This is really cool. I wouldn't want to play it this way, but it's still really <laughs> no, cool. No. Now, I was trying to remember, the GBA is like maybe twice as powerful as a Super Nintendo. Yeah. It's is that like, because I, I remember there was like lots of Super Nintendo games, uh, sort of uh, uh, ported Super Nintendo games, but like a little bit nicer came out on the GBA. Yeah, that was my feeling. That I... um, so yeah, GBA... The old, uh, this is, you know, not, we're not talking SP, we're not talking 3DS. Original GBA. With no backlight. Game yeah. Boy Advance, the one that came after the color. Yeah. Um, somebody, uh, some, some mad person, has uh, worked to port uh, portions of Super Mario 64, the 3D game, Super Mario 64, mm -hmm. Uh, to, um, to, to the GBA, uh, to the GBA. Yeah. Uh, it, this is amazing because I mean, it's an amazing achievement. I don't know if I'd want to play it, I, but it's an amazing achievement. I would love to give it a try just to see how it feels because if it, if it's possible, it, it, mm. was, a, it was a quick system. It, it, uh, it played games really well. Because of course, all this would be. It's not like they're the the uh, uh, GBA would have any kind of three D mm -hmm. acceleration. So this is all being done in uh, as oh, sort of uh, as like sprites and uh, I don't know, maybe using some weird mode wonder, seven mm -hmm. stuff. I don't know weird some some sort of, some serious. You can see weird transforms going on and on the the mapping stuff. I mean, I wonder how the camera control is running. But what really uh, piqued my interest about this was a few weeks back, we got that information that uh, you're able to decompile uh, N64 games down into C code. Oh, yeah? And that make, that's been making it very easy for people to do PC ports of these uh, of these N64 games and, you know, right. remaster and clean them up. Somebody's made, like, a super high-res, fancy version of Mario 60, yeah. sort of the opposite. And so I thought, I thought that's what this is based on. And I'm thinking, okay, he's just taken the, uh, the decompiled code and, and started reworking. No, no, no. This is apparently uh, because, as you say, Paul, there is no 3D hardware on the, on the uh, GBA. He just had to completely rewrite everything from scratch. So yeah, yeah. this is building. I presumably yeah, building his and his own three D engine, uh, all sorts of cool stuff. So anyway, yeah, I think my pro my biggest problem with it is the ground textures and mm. the way they move, and it kind of feels like watching. Like this isn't too bad. Once it's like once they're taken away, I I find this a lot more easy to process mm -hmm. but like watching the stonework kind of just move like weird ocean waves yeah. was kind of a is it, lot is it weird that to me the non-textured version kind of looks more like mario 64 i remember yeah from the six like it's weird the way like like that that somehow the I mean, all, you know, yeah, the like textures sort of warp and everything. Yeah, and stuff. I, I, I don't I, like as much. I would love to give this back to uh, to the programmers at Nintendo, you know, people who are familiar with the GBA system, and say, okay, how would you finish this to get this to a state that you would Nintendo would consider shipping? What, what, what are the uh, sorry? The I, I love the checkerboard on the ground. <laughs> yeah, it's so wonky. Having a day. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I'm sure they'll be able to. Uh, they'll they'll. Uh, figure that out it's but it's a re it's a really cool thing that someone's done yeah um and and you know shows i'm sure uh, you know it's it's uh, there's all sorts of fun stuff about all those you know weird fancy tricks they can do you can do on uh to make some of these old systems i always find the the last year of a game console's life is mm -hmm. when the most interesting games usually come out for because you've gotten to the point where everyone knows the ins and outs of the system, mm -hmm. knows the hacks, and are pushing that system for all it's worth. Uh, yeah, yeah rather than, you know... They did they did do a version of Mario 64 for the DS. Yes. 
Right, yeah. Uh, it was a little bit different because you could swap characters and do mm -hmm. a few different things. The but... DS was a much more powerful system. Yeah. It's, but it's interesting that uh, we're, we are, like, I feel like there is that, that, that sort of cutoff where it's like now, even, you know, PC or console, you know, you're just like, you're making it in Unity or, or, or whatever. And it's, and it's, it's not, I'm not saying it's easy, but uh, it, the, the tool chain is a lot different and a lot more sort of standardized. Especially when you're trying to make a game that's going to be released on multiple different platforms with their mm. own quirks. Right. And there's like, there's no question that the system we have now is much more efficient from a developer standpoint. Mm -hmm. But there is like a bit of nostalgia for that, that kind of old school, mm -hmm. uh, uh, real um, optimization. And I mean, you, you do see stuff, especially, you know, in, in things like, say, you know, when the Switch gets a port from one of the, uh, you know, from, from Xbox or PlayStation, the quality of those ports can vary a lot mm. depending on how much optimization and trickiness mm -hmm. the developers have and experience with the Switch hardware and what it's capable of and what it shouldn't yeah. be doing. And yet you will get ports that are like, uh, my understanding is The Witcher 3 is a decent port on the Switch. Like it's mm. considered a miracle port. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. When when people can pull off that, it's like this shouldn't happen. This shouldn't work the way it does. But it, but because they know enough about the system, they can make it proper. Anyway, I just thought that was cool. Uh, I'm always in favor of more silly uh, more silly ports and stuff. Uh, like in like a lot of things these these days, especially if you're talking Nintendo stuff, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets DMCA'd <laughs> at some point. I just sad. I, I am happy that they are uh, very explicit about the fact that if I ever end up shipping this, I will not be able to do so with it with any of Nintendo's textures. And I'd yeah, say, yeah. There's, uh, I mean, there's there's a couple of Super Mario sixty four projects happening online that people have been documenting, and uh, I don't think any of those have been taken down yet. Mm -hmm. And they've been kind of long running. But, Nintendo likes to wait until people are finished and have done a lot of work before they start taking things down. I think it's. I think they get off on it. Yeah. Uh, and um, speaking of old games that look oh, kind of poopy. <laughs> what? I just thought you were going to be like speaking of getting off on things. Oh. Uh, hey, you know, if that's what if this is what you go <laughs> gets you off, then you know. Just, More power you know, to you. Sometimes I like to try to predict your. Uh, uh, do do <laughs> you like place. Do you like Resident Evil? Uh, I'm so sorry if you do because uh, for the you, bit, you've, yes. Yeah, I was gonna say if you're a Resident Evil fan, uh, you've had a hard life. Yeah, it's been a bit of a roller coaster over the last few years. Maybe so they're just a little scared. So buckle up again. But uh, you. Now, you might think that I'm about to be talking about uh, a, uh, a new uh, Resident Evil remaster because everything's being remastered these days. Um, and in fact, Resident Evil has been remastered at least once. It might be in the Dead, Dead Rising category of having been remastered multiple mm -hmm. times. Uh, but that's not what this is about because if, you're on, if you uh, go to GOG, you can get actual OG Resident Evil, mm -hmm. the non-remastered version. Wait, Vintage why code. is this sad for people who like Resident Evil? Wouldn't this be, isn't this the kind of thing that people, nerds get all like, ah, yes, finally I can play it the way it was meant to be played in its original form. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing, you can do that, but now you can do that in a slightly less original way. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is the, um, the original 1996 version. And I mean, I, I it's this is I feel like this is probably one of those things where, you know, you you boot it up and you're like, oh, this is not, <laughs> this is less good than I remember it because you know there's some nostalgia goggles on there. Yep. You were allowed uh, to play Resident Evil in '96. You get your uh, get your. That get is your, not a game my parents would have allowed me to play. Yeah, get get your uh, get your tank controls ready. Oh yeah, get ready to experience that again. But um, at least you'll be uh, you'll be able to see some uncensored footage. 
Yeah, so the original, it originally came out for PlayStation in 1996, and then it was ported to Windows, which included uncensored footage, <gasps> which I'm assuming is like more, more goriness. I, I would hope I, so. I mean, I hope so. I don't remember Resident Evil being a sexy series. Oh, Chris is smoking a cigarette. Oh, they oh wouldn't, okay. Yep, you yep. can't get away with that on I a mean, console. it was the 90s. They were very anti-smoking. Peggy, not even once. I mean, we're st now we're just anti-vaping, I think. At least that's all the commercials I keep seeing at the Games Awards. Uh, and they apparently, uh, they also added two unlockable weapons in the PC version. The Ingram submachine gun for Jill and the Mini-Me light machine gun for Chris. Uh, and also PC-exclusive unlockable costumes. In 1996... PC exclusive unlocking the <laughs> costumes. I mean, I think I think it's very important they have the original out there because I believe is isn't isn't the updated version the one that takes out the whole Jill sandwich thing that's such a meme. Oh really? I don't know. So I don't two, play these games. So I'm just making up stuff. The game came out in 1996. There was a 2002 remake for Windows, uh, which is our is still like 2002 is still you know 20 years like. Uh, still 20 years old, but anyway, and I, yeah, like I believe there's been another more recent remake since then. Um, anyway, uh, but if you want to see the OG where it all started, uh, that's the one to go for. I and it's like not only have they remade Resident Evil One, mm -hmm. but like the story. Like that, the the people going into the mansion yeah. and all that stuff and then finding the thing underneath the mansion. Like that story, I feel like, not only has been remade in all the Resident Evil games, but like has been retold oh, yeah. in at least in like like in at least two movies. It's essentially a fable at this and, point. And like I think one or two other games. I, I hope what we're looking at here isn't a Sony Spider Man situation though where they need to, for some reason, release the original game every X number of years to uh, maintain a copyright or something. I, I thought I thought you were going to... I thought you meant in the in the sense of, like, enter the Resident <laughs> Evil-verse. I don't, I don't think... I don't think... Um, that they're all actually... Don't give many ideas, Paul. <laughs> all, the, all the versions of this story are actually one... one uh, different different timelines of the yeah, same I thing. Don't, I, don't, I don't think uh, Capcom has any dealings... To specifically have Resident Evil happen in that same way, mm -hmm. no. And, and what you're talking about is actually, I believe, uh, Capcom versus Marvel. <laughs> right. Yeah. Of course, they've actually done that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me see. Oh, um, Atari Fifty. Yeah. It's being fifty again. So. Uh, Speaking of being old. <laughs> yeah. So Atari Fifty. Um, uh, is a uh, was a uh, the I think I guess I'm, I guess the fiftieth anniversary right of course yeah it, it came out a couple of years ago yeah came out a couple of years ago the fiftieth anniversary celebration of uh, Atari and um, very well received and it's a super neat um, collection because it's I believe in, encapsulates yeah. fifty games it's but it's not just here are the fifty games it's actually a basically like a documentary a timeline. You, you a have. timeline of like this is what we did for this thing, and then not only like here's a picture of the game, it's like here's the actual game. You I, can just I don't, go play I don't it. think it's actually fifty games. Is it not fifty? The, games? I think oh. Atari Fifty is the fiftieth anniversary. But number, it's not. thirty-nine games. It looks like are being added. Uh, now, that's, so, so yeah, it's different. Yeah, but it may not be fifty. Yeah. But giving you context to where the, to what was happening in the industry and in Atari at the time about those games just really helps to put you in the, in the mindset of oh that's why this is good or terrible and and you know like uh, it's, it's, you know they put the real game in there rather than just like a picture of the game although when I think about it uh, most of these games would actually probably be smaller than a picture of itself yep mm -hmm. which is kind of funny I love it. <laughs> yeah so this is the this is like the expanded version that they're yeah, putting out so now the, so they're bringing out a uh, Atari 50 anniversary celebration expanded steelbook edition which uh, I guess they, they they found that there's more history 
Yeah, I think more uh, history if happened. you already if you have the digital version, this is either it's just like either free DLC or it's a DLC portion yeah. that you can add on, and then of course love the physical edition, which will be different. Yeah. Uh, oh, it has. Oh, in fact, has over a hundred games. The original one from a lot of different systems to it peers. Yeah, yeah I've uh, cool. I've heard people talk about this one uh, on some things I've listened to, and it, it sounds like it's it's really well it's, laid out. It's sort it's of a really, gold standard. It's for... really interesting. Uh, it's it's nice to be able to quickly go into a game and play five minutes of it to get the idea and then move on to something like, else. In, in this day and age of, of shambling husks of brands like Polaroid and Technicolor just being dragged through the mud by uh, private and equity groups. Seeing Atari actually succeed in that same sort of... Uh, I was going to say, I'm pretty sure Atari is always one of those as well. Yeah, but it, it is. We make fun of it all the time for it. Yeah, but yeah. This, this is like one of the cool things they've actually done. Um, so yeah, they, they've found more history. Uh, and they've, they're doing a, <laughs> a, a DLC package or, or they're, they're this expansion with 39 more games. This is... Yeah, this is great to hear this sort of history being laid out. This might be less about them finding more history and more like if, if this was about them trying to get a 50th anniversary thing together, mm -hmm. they right. needed more That's time to add more stuff in. Publishing it, and I guess, as I was just saying, it also props up the idea that this Atari is still a good uh, good steward of Atari-ness. And, and also presumably that the previous one sold pretty well. Yeah, so that's too, like, probably. Well, yeah. Yeah. Like, we can keep making these. Um, but yeah, and, and so there's not only 39 new games, but there's also uh, a bunch of new like video clips of uh, um, uh, people, both both archival footage and uh, uh, new footage mm -hmm. uh, of people talking about their various, you know, the guy who did Pong talking about it. It's so important to get this thing, this information and these sorts of interviews recorded while we still can. Uh, especially reminding of uh, earlier this week as well, it's slightly video game adjacent, the Living Computer Museum down mm. in Seattle, Washington, yeah, uh, yeah. which was a part of Paul Allen's big collection, has finally, uh, they, they run out of the trust that they're covering. It was run out of money, and they are, they are now going to be auctioning off a bunch of them and closing the place down completely. So They got pretty, uh, they got pretty hosed during the pandemic. Yeah, they did, mm. unfortunately. But uh, yeah, so that's a lot of history that's going to just disappear uh, from the public eye. And so being able to like put out a 50th anniversary like this that's playable, usable, and, uh, and interesting and educational, I'm really yeah, yeah. A really big fan. And don't, don't forget, Atari bought like a bunch of stuff from Amico or in television, except for the Amico. Mm -hmm. Right. They wouldn't touch that. Gosh. And they're, they're re... Uh, I mean, I, didn't, I don't think I marked it as a story, but... Uh, and because they've, they've launched, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago, that Atari has relaunched in television as a brand for their, like, new kind of indie projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a cool name. Uh, or so far it's not indie, it's not like their indie projects, but it's it's a place for them to put things that they buy, basically. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they just bought another Sometimes game. Sometimes you need to buy a box to put the things that you buy. Yeah. In. But they, they just bought another game. But, yeah, we were, we were talking about the... Uh, when that came out, we were talking about like the the relationship between Atari uh, and Infograms, mm -hmm. and how like they've they've s switched positions, and like one company has bought the other, and then renamed itself the previous company. <laughs> so many like yeah. in, in all these weird configurations that it's very complicated. It's a weird Frankenstein zombie. Uh, anyway. Acquire Kodak next. What uh, other old games do we have? Uh, so this is not strictly a video game story <gasps> I have here. A non-video game story on a video game story podcast? But it is about gaming. Show. And Sorry, I, this is not a podcast. I thought this was really interesting. <laughs> I, I thought this was a cool thing. Um, Mattel, uh, the maker of uh, mini... Uh, board, man's daddy. Mini board games. The non-Hasbro. Uh, wait, did wait? A minute. Is Mattel owned by Hasbro? No, or? I believe they're still no. they're separate. separate. Yeah. Okay, cool. they're like the two, <laughs> the two remaining ones. toy companies. Uh, but anyway, um, they uh, have made a commitment um, to have at least eighty percent of their game catalog um, colorblind accessible. I do think that's by the end of twenty twenty four. Yep, and what this means 
is, uh, here, let me uh, open this up. Um, what this means is, so we're talking physical games here. So, uh, you know, and like if you've played Uno or other games like that, color is kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the main thing about it. And so they've done a bunch of consulting with uh, uh, people who are uh, knowledgeable about these kinds of things. And, and have lived the experiences, <laughs> keep uh, doing that. And have added, uh, you know, for instance, for, for uh, Uno, they've added these symbols um, in order to differentiate the cards by something other than color. Uh, they've added little bananas to the tops of the tumbling monkeys, mm -hmm. but different configurations of bananas. They've added patterns to uh, the... Blockus. Blockus. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a super cool idea, and it's a super interesting... Um, way to do it, you know, rather to, to, and it's one of these things that I, I like this kind of stuff where it's like, it helps obviously helps colorblind people uh, who previously may not have been able to play, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or at least not be able to play it as well. Um, but it's also, there's an interesting aspect to this where it's like, it also means that, uh, People, you know, even if you're not colorblind, having another source of information. Differentiation, yeah. So, you know, maybe you can just, maybe you can take your Uno cards and just like hold them really, you know, tightly in your hand with just those little symbols up at the top now mm -hmm. because you don't have the, yeah. you don't have to pay that much attention to Especially color. if you're losing and you have a lot of cards in your hand. It's, it's a visual designer by day. It's very difficult to be able to make up a color, a complex color palette that is also properly accessibility in terms of contrast and color differentiation. Mm. And so, yeah, going to symbols is, is one of the easiest ways to do that. But I'm mean, just a huge uh, proponent of accessibility in all ways mm. because every it, we all please forget that uh, being young is the aberration. You know, we get. We all start getting older at birth and never stop. And so we're going to need some form of, of uh, assistive device, each and every one of us at some point in our lives. You know, something as simple as one of these. So just having it baked into the idea of, uh, of everything that you produce from the beginning makes it so much easier than trying to hack things on after the fact. But these look to be very well thought out and not at all just hacked in mm. accessibility. And uh, yeah, in the various... Things, um, you know, in, in to sort of bring it back to video games, obviously that's something that comes up a lot mm -hmm. um, in video games, um, trying to make things both sort of colorblind accessible and accessible in all sorts mm -hmm. of different ways. And we, we've talked about, you know, because it, it's, it's a subject that I'm kind of interested in. Um, and so I will, it'll often uh, uh, strike my fancy to, to mark stories about it uh, when I see something that... Um, is sort of an interesting implementation mm -hmm. yeah. of yeah, uh, I, accessibility Especially stuff. on board games and things like this, it, being able to add in something that's a very simple implementation. It doesn't It doesn't actually take that much more effort outside of the we need to discuss and mm -hmm. figure out how, how to do it portion of, of building yeah. your cards, right? Like I feel like with something like this, most of the effort is just sort of acknowledging that it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in, <laughs> within within video game design, that's those conversations need to happen during the beginning design phases. The earlier the, it happens, yeah, the, the earlier easier it is. The easier it is to implement, which is I, I why often, why people want those conversations earlier. I often think about um, uh, I saw I think it was like a TED talk or something by uh, the one of the designers behind like OXO, mm -hmm. Good Grips, yeah. Uh, and he was talking about how it's like, okay, we want to, you know, we want to design a, whatever, a, a, a potato peeler that, and, and, you know, we want to target this uh, audience of, uh, uh, you know, people who don't have as much grip strength. Uh, grip strength. So, you know, they, they spend a lot of work on it and they design, you know, it's got the uh, nicely thicker handle. Mm -hmm. It's got all the stuff. In the the yeah, all the stuff and put it out. People really loved it. And it was, you know, much more accessible for people. And it was great that, you know, this this sort of, to, you know, 10% or 20% of people mm -hmm. that previously were having trouble with it. But the interesting thing is they found out that 
everybody else also liked it. Yeah. <laughs> everybody, yeah. it's like everyone else was like, I mean, I don't need it. I can use a regular potato peeler, but, but this why? one's better. This exists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's nice to just use things that are easier to use. Yeah, the the Apple AirPods are another good example of that. With the when the Pros came out with their uh, mm. their version of the pass through technology, mm. uh, a lot of people suddenly realized that hey. I need hearing aids <laughs> because I can hear a lot better with this pass through through my AirPods turned up than I can normally. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, just again, realization that, yeah. You, Beach you... will actually wear his in uh, crowds just for the noise canceling yeah. because it tunes out like a lot of the crowd noise, but you can still hear people who are talking to you face to face. That's super cool. And some yeah. people need that sort of uh, filtering in order yeah. to be able to function in society. They, people actually do that with big headphones and stuff. Like they'll go to, it It seems weird if you don't think about it. Like if you're going to a loud dance party or you're going to a convention with a lot of people, but you're wearing like the big fuck off, don't talk to me headphones. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's actually more about reducing the sound and being able to be in the space these yeah. days. I've, uh, yeah, I mean, I know, I know there's, Lots of people have talked about, I, I think um, Adam Savage actually did the thing talking about, he's got he hearing aids. And he's like, they're great. It's, yeah. it's like the best Bluetooth headphones you've ever had, <laughs> yeah. except they're fitted perfectly to your ear. Mm -hmm. And he has like an app on his phone where he can change the like, EQ. Yep. Yeah. I want to I want to clarify since that came up in chat. Beach doesn't have hearing aids. He uses the Apple AirPods with the noise canceling on to reduce sound in large crowded areas. Yeah. That's not really the same thing. I remember I had some like cheap headphones with noise canceling on them. And I was like, oh, this would be great. Turn on, I can hear much better. And I was like, wait a minute. Pretty sure this noise canceling just Ma it's just making the headphones louder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think it's actually some, some, canceling some any of, noise. Some of the cheaper stuff definitely does it that way. Anyway, uh, finally, um, we've got something, uh, again, it's been a very retro, <laughs> retro day. Uh, think about uh, the 3DS Street Pass. Um, and this is actually similar to some of the stories we've done in the past about people trying to uh, archive or find uh, ephemeral games or, or things that were only briefly available. Filling in the edges of the outline, really. Um, and so uh, 3DS had the street pass system where you could transfer stuff back and forth. And uh, part of that was something called Puzzle Swap. Yeah. Which, it was actually one of the coolest parts of Street Pass. Yeah, so you could like, it, it would you would sort of get puzzle pieces from people. Yeah, so uh, uh, so Street Pass was when uh, it was specifically when two people with both with 3DSs with the thing turned on would pass each other. The two devices would essentially notify each other, and then when you opened up your 3DS later, you could go in, and that person's me would walk past, and if they had a puzzle piece you didn't have, they would give you a puzzle piece, and then it would get added to your, your puzzles. Mm -hmm. uh, they also had a thing they called Spot Pass, which was similar, but it worked with like Wi-Fi routers and stuff. And This idea that like your, your 3DS is like talking to other 3DSs and like has its own, you know, it's like been off doing its own thing while, you, while it was in your bag, <laughs> talking to other 3DSs. Oh gossiping about you i mean it was it was a pretty cool feature i really wish that it was on something more modern day uh but like originally so the puzzle swap thing was uh kind of like the free part of street pass because eventually they added like uh some pay for dlc games that you could put in it was almost but, like a, a proto like a a, a a predecessor to things like pokemon go or whatever like it's mm. sort of th that idea of like using the device to encourage people to get out so, there in the DS, in like Dragon Quest Warrior, I think Dragon Warrior, some in one of the one of those games, there was a function where if you kept the game running and you had the DS closed, you could do a similar thing, and there would be meetups and stuff in Japan specifically for it because the game was more popular over there. <laughs> this the, the Street Pass is actually just a, a, a stronger version of that because you don't need the games open; you just right. need the system on, and you could tell the system up to a certain number of games that you would want to be able to spreading that information for. And yeah, the puzzle thing, when it first started, uh, all the puzzle pieces, uh, when you see them in your, in your little frame, are uh, blue with question marks. And so you get a blue puzzle piece. Now the system also had a pedometer where you could earn coins, so you could just 
ask for random puzzle pieces and try to fill in. But they started adding puzzles uh, that were blue pieces, but also pink pieces. And you could only get the pink pieces by swapping with other people. Uh, okay. And that's and, probably where, and that's where this here. is kind of more important. Right. And so there were also, there's a special, they, they also did promotional things. And so mm -hmm. uh, special, there were special puzzles that were delivered that you could only get within a certain period of time. And again, you could only get them from, uh, you know, within a certain period of time and also from trading back and forth with people. And uh, so in particular, um, from July 21st to September 30th in Japan <laughs> in 2012, uh, they, there were a couple of puzzles, which, and, and so the idea here is that they, they're, people are concerned, they, they want to archive these puzzles. And because they were only available for such a short amount of time so long ago, uh, they're not necessarily available anymore. You have to find somebody who's got this puzzle, mm -hmm. who had actually yeah. completed this puzzle. Physically go to their location. Uh, and so here's the, uh, here's the th it's this, uh, this like 787 airplane. Yeah. <sighs> usually the puzzles you would get would be like, oh, there's a Mario game coming out. So here's a puzzle with Mario and like friends doing whatever, or like maybe there's a Pikmin puzzle or, or whatever, but yeah. The lines are in there to show you where the plane is going to come apart. <laughs> <laughs> so they know they know that this, like they've got this picture. They know that it exists, but um, they have been unable to find a sort of version of this out in the wild that they can then ex sort of extract. Yeah, and, they're missing and, one puzzle piece save. out of it. Um, is there just one puzzle piece that they're yeah, missing? Yeah, I believe there's just one piece left that they're missing. Oof. Um they're they're in uh, a there's like a specific Discord or something set up to try to find it because there is there is like um uh, what do they call it? They call it NetPass, I think, where mm -hmm. if you have a modded 3DS, there's this somebody has implemented this thing where you can go onto an online server for your Mies to meet kind of and it'll so sort they've, of emulate, I think it'll been, emulate it. Yeah, um, so they I think they've been trying to get stuff through that way. Um so yeah, this is it's information is being spreading. I I don't think uh, sort of you know I don't think our audience is is e e much wider distributed than <laughs> stuff where it's already. But you know who knows mm -hmm. if you were in Japan uh, between uh, July and September 2012 with the 3ds, maybe but, you have this. But, but here's the thing: you didn't have to be. If uh, if someone from Japan came over to another area and street passed with somebody, they oh, would have gotten a maybe. puzzle piece, and you can yeah. move those puzzle pieces on. That's that's what made it so neat to me when it first came out, because I was like, man, it'd be really neat if you could essentially, uh, you know, that whole you take a dollar bill and you write a website on it, and people track where it's yep. been been right, to. Right, right. But like with street pass and puzzle pieces, they just move automatically. It's yeah, because it's not like you lose the puzzle piece to them. You, you're right. giving them a copy of mm -hmm. it. So uh, if you think you might have it, uh, contact these people. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, this is, you know, this is, this is one of those weird things where it's like, you know, we know what the picture is. It's like a promotional picture for uh, ANA Airlines, right? Yeah. It's like, it's not an important picture, but it's the idea yeah. of archiving this whole thing and having a complete package, a complete mm -hmm. collection of it. Did you uh, did you did you know about SwapNote? No, what's SwapNote? So uh, there was a piece of software called SwapNote that worked with StreetPass, where essentially you could write letters to people, and if they street passed each other, you could basically send out those letters randomly. When it first came out, you could do that with anyone you street passed, and then at some point they locked that down to only if you street pass people you know who are in your <laughs> friends list, which really hampered the whole project because there there were people who were doing like D, D dungeon things through swap notice they went by it was like some really cool stuff that happened with that because you could have like a note that was like this was written in at this time like at this time yeah. at this date at this place and then see how far it gets or and a little me avatar i think her name was uh nikki and uh you could get different stationary to put on your notes and like little stickers and, and stuff like it was really oh, cool i'm sure with, with that, that one 
stroke of a pen, Nintendo deleted so many street pass notes that were just eight equals 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 D. <laughs> <laughs> People are really into math. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never seen that one proven before. So yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, very, they also very really like uh, complicated math equations. Eight zero zero eight five. They already they also really enjoyed. Yeah, yeah. People really like numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, StreetPass had some really cool functions to it. It's, it was such yeah. an interesting technology, that it, that brave new world that was the beginning of the social networks, but also of, uh, of augmented reality and local computing. It's one of those interesting things Nintendo does and then stops doing inexplicably. Well, I mean... Uh, you had to have the system on as... all day. I, I feel like the Switch battery probably couldn't handle it. And... Well... Probably not but with a uh, with a low power radio. Yeah, yeah it's, I, it's, I, I would I would love if they brought it back. <laughs> yeah, it is, and it is sort of a, a very. Or if somebody else did something similar, I, <laughs> I I don't really care if Nintendo does it. But it's neat to have something like that. That's sort of uh, not stealth, but it's sort of um, incidentally loaded up. Like it's you know <laughs> you could you could easily make like a little whatever pager type device that would do street pass stuff. Mm -hmm. But nobody would buy them because it would be just like a thing. Yeah. But to have it sort of something that people are buying anyway and might even have on them and not be sort of actively, oh, I'm going to find street pass people, but just sort of you have it in your backpack or whatever. Oh, yeah. And it just kind of incidentally picked I mean, up. I stuff. would love it if, if they if, put if it on you the phone. If you could put one of those things on something like this. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, if only we had the level of competition needed in the market to allow people to put arbitrary applications on these devices we carry with us every day. I mean, as you with the uh, thing about the the swap note stuff, you know, uh, AirDrop is bad enough in terms of uh, <laughs> people sending things that they probably shouldn't. Yeah, definitely, it's it's one of those. It it is one of those things where basically somebody did something that was bad, and now we can't have nice things. Yeah, but it was a really really cool thing. The other the other one they had it wasn't a street pass rate, uh, but it was um, flip note on the 3ds was a um it's essentially the same idea it's a little notebook thing but it it's meant to basically be able to do some slight animation with cartoons because you're it's like a flip book oh okay like flip book animation and that was a piece of software that i think you could get for free for a while or it was like a nintendo points thing or whatever but it you know you after then... the after the 3ds we moved to the switch it doesn't really exist there could you then like send those notes over street pass to other people I, I don't think so i don't think it used that functionality but it was still like a really neat piece of software hmm. i still remember the civico as being the best example of that it was a, a big palm like pager device with a full keyboard and a big old antenna that ran in the 500 gigahertz uh, range and the idea oh, wow. was that you would you just buy this as a kid, and anyone you know within a, a half mile radius of you would have instant free uh, wireless communication back and forth between people. And of course, it did have those sort sorts of ambient uh, pick up a friend things too. Sort of an ad hoc mesh network. Thing. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, cool. it just unfortunately was just a little bit too expensive for everyone to have them and to gain that mass uh, that mass knowledge. But and and you know as as Heather says you know. Somebody does something that ruins it for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, things things like that uh, uh, tend to be, you know, you sort of have the um, the 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 uh, ambitious um, best case scenario, but then you uh, sometimes have, you have to uh, come up with what the worst case scenario yeah. <laughs> yeah. is. Unfortunately. So after having your that, that, that first initial conversation about accessibility, then if you're planning an, an online service, you should probably have a second uh, important conversation about moderation. And security. Yeah, I remember, you know, uh, our friend uh, Stepto, who, uh, who was the, the um, uh, Xbox policy and enforcement. Rip in power. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he always would talk about, he's like, you know, some new game would be coming out. Uh, and usually far too late in the process, they would bring in the policy and enforcement mm -hmm. people, and it was his job to basically crush all their dreams and be like, <laughs> this is how people are going to use your service. <laughs> yeah. 
Speaking of Uno. Uh, <laughs> Street Pass was really great if you went to a convention, though. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like as a, as a device for something to do while you're waiting in line or you're walking around to spend a few oh, minutes. It just it it's just really fun. adds to the experience. Yeah. yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, it's, uh, if you, I just thought that's, uh, it's cool that, um, you know, people collecting this, uh, this last uh, puzzle piece. Hey, if you happen to be uh, available to uh, to grab it, yeah. Hey, maybe you can help them out. Otherwise, uh, but anyway, you might have to join a Discord. But <laughs> courage, <laughs> sacrifices have to be made. <laughs> you can leave after for the greater good. Yeah. Uh, I need everything when I'm done. Anyway, uh, all right. That is. All the news that I thought was interesting to talk about this week, um, <laughs> and uh, hope, like I said, hopefully uh, we'll be back to uh, regular checkpoint next week. Um, but in the meantime, thank you all for uh, joining us, and uh, I hope you hope you have a good rest of the day. Uh, so I uh, will talk to y'all later. Goodbye. Bye.